this presentation will discuss historical events and themes that may be um, distressing or produce emotions to some of the participants. Um, we have listed here um, the folks at your agency um, who can provide you support or you can give feedback for this presentation. Um, we'll, we will also put those in the chat so that you have those contact, um, contacts easily available. Um, and we encourage you to reach out to these folks if anything does come up. Um, but with that, I'm really excited to pass it over to Professor Lewis and hear our presentation today. Thank you all for being here. Share some screens here, so get this going. All right, hopefully you can see one image rather than two, which is helpful. Um, thank you for inviting me. This is a lot of fun uh, always to do these presentations. Um, I've done quite a bit of research on tribes in Oregon over the years. Some of you may, some of you may have seen me before. Um, and, uh, and as I do more research, uh, history um, becomes deeper and changes and more significant, more important to me. And uh, so this is kind of the culmination of some 25 years of research, for me at least. So uh, glad to be here. Um, my tribes are uh, Chinook, Santiam, and Tecalma, and uh, a member of the Grand Ronde tribe as well as assistant professor at OSU in anthropology ethics studies. So, all right, let's start. First off, introduce you to the tribes. Uh, this is um, the tribes on the Columbia River, uh, mainly Chinookan peoples from the Deschutes of the far west uh, through the Wasco, Wishram, Cascades, Clackamas, Multnomah, uh, in the Clatsop, Lower Band of Chinooks, Wheel of Bay uh, peoples, and Shoalwater Bay peoples, all Chinookan peoples spoke Chinook language or Kikst language. There are several other tribes in here too. We have two Tillamook tribes, the Tualatin for comparison, and then we have uh, Clatskanai as well. So there were a good number of Chinookan tribes on the Columbia. They kind of owned it in, 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 in respects to like trade and, and having villages right on the water. And there were a good number of them. There's not just one Chinook tribe. There are a number of Chinook tribes, all uh, sort of led by uh, significant chiefs um, in, into the 1850s. Uh, at that time, um, as we'll describe later on, most of the tribes were placed on reservations. So in all of Oregon, there were probably at least 100 tribes, at least 60 in Western Oregon alone. Here are, as we go south into the Wyant Valley, we see a lot of the, uh, the Kalapuya tribes and Malala peoples as well. Uh, Clackamas at the top, which are, again, Chinookan, but we have Tualatin, Yamhill, Lucky Mute, Chamafo, Chelamela, Saniam, Tekapa, and all the way down into the Umpqua Valley, there are the Yonkala peoples. So we have a good, a good number of tribes, Kalapuya tribes as well, individual tribes, that where villages would band around one significant powerful chief or several powerful chiefs and then they would have their own sort of tribe uh that were aligned with the, where, where there was a number of bands aligned with that one tribe and so uh, there wasn't again one Kalapuya tribe there were a good number of them at some estimates before disease hit the area probably 18 or more tribes in the area so and then on the on the eastern side of the valley, uh, we have uh, the Malala peoples. Uh, several tribes of Malala, the you know the Sanyam Forks Band of Malala, the Mountain Band of Malala, and even further south, will show uh, the southern Malala peoples, all kind of in the foothills, into the Cascades somewhat. Um, uh, they were also in the valley as well, so they had a significant. Uh, not ownership of, but occupation of the valley, at least. Going down into southern Oregon, we have, or southwestern Oregon, we have the Umpqua Basin, which had at least five tribes with different languages living in that basin. And then we have the Rogue River Basin below them with uh, the Tecumas and Shastas and even Athabascans kind of into the basin. But the Umpqua Basin for me is really exciting because there's the Malala peoples, 
We have Cow Creeks, which are actually Tacoma speakers. Uh, then we and they're called Cow Creek Umquas, but they're actually Tacoma speakers. We have Upper Umqua, which are Athabascan speakers. Yonkalas, which are actually Kalapuya tribes, and then Lower Umqua, which came into the valley somewhat, which were their own isolate uh, language group, along with Sayusla and maybe Kus. And so, uh, interesting arrangement in the valley, and and uh, um, th these are the tribes of that area. And then in all of Oregon, like I said, there's probably at least 100 tribes, 100 different tri tribal leaders with main major villages, maybe 60 or more languages and dialects of languages uh, in, in the whole of Oregon. Uh, so quite a lot going on. There was not one Indian people. There were a good number of different peoples speaking upwards of five different fa family languages. Uh, as well as the the 60 or more dialects in the area. So a lot going on. And this, again, most of it changed in the 1850s with the rule of the reservations. Um, I really focus mostly on Western Oregon. So we'll, we'll deal with more of the Chinookan peoples and Kalapui peoples of Western Oregon in this presentation. Um, there's just not enough time in the world to deal with all the tribes of Oregon in one presentation. So we do, I... I then focus on what I know. Um, this area is uh, an area, a, a map of by Lewis and Clark of um, what we could now call the Portland Basin. It's um, it's a whole, it's a lot of the riverside, and has a lot going on. There's lots of villages, lots of people. There's probably ten to twenty thousand people living in this area before colonization, and so. Lewis and Clark came along when at the height of their population, probably. And some of their villages are quite large. This right here, kind of in the center, shows 25 houses, which each house could have hold, held, you know, 20 to, four, to 50 people, depending on how what the size of the house was. So th these villages qu could have been quite large. We also know, and we'll talk more about this, that many of these peoples were not always living in this area that they moved up and down the river uh, according to seasons and so we'll talk more about that in a minute but this shows a lot going on it also shows i like these maps because they show kind of uh what the you know Lewis and clark expedition was after they were after understanding the resources in the area uh, after uh getting the names of tribes how, how many people were in the tribes and in what in in, in basically a, a preparation for claim of this area of, or of Oregon and the river for the United States later on. So um, here's a little more broader aspect of this map. I, I put several maps together to show, you know, how the trail, how the, the river trail worked. We now, we sometimes call them river highways worked. We see cascades on the far right up here. They're, they're summer villages, spring, summer, and fall villages. And then they would move into the Portland Basin uh, by Salvia Island up in the far left over here. And uh, they would they would occupy these villages in the wintertime. Um, mainly, they moved there to, to because it was really, really cold in the gorge. And, um, and so it's warmer in the valley. And then uh, there's quite a bit of Wapato crops in um, the area of Portland. So the Wapato was an under water or kind of sub semi water uh crop of of tubers sometimes called indian potato and we'll talk again more about that in a second um and the trade system of the of the of the whole region really was fueled by by this uh multi-tribal kinship systems where people would live i would, would sort of intermarry with other tribes that was part of um a rule of the law, actually, you would have to uh, marry outside your tribe. Uh, you're not allowed to marry inside your tribe. So there was always this sort of a multi-tribal, almost multinational aspect to what people were doing. This also kept uh, all the tribes in the region from whatever language group kind of related and uh, I think caused a lot of peace. Uh, there was a lot of warfare. People were interrelated. So you're not going to really necessarily make war on your relatives. Uh, and uh, and so there's lots of trade. The the trade chiefs 
would get quite rich off uh, this trade uh, from their their relations. And so um, so that's a really important aspect that maybe needs to be emphasized more, this idea of trade and kinship uh, being uh, the major factor. And we see like going in history into history with the fur trade and everything, that many of these trade chiefs on the Columbia began to began to integrate uh, their marriages of their daughters and sisters and, and whoever they had control over uh, with the fur traders. Um, and this brought the Americans into their, their sphere of family and uh, shows a little bit of how the tribes began to incorporate the Americans and even the British into uh, the trade system. Sometimes it's, it's written about, it's talked about as, or written about as, as being um, uh, a system that was changed mainly by the by the Americans and the British and by the colonialists but we can actually see aspects of of the change happening at the at the behest of the tribal leaders as well they were in, in favor of many of the changes that came in the early period um and just to just to throw in a little bit of longer history um this slide shows uh, perhaps um, it, it's a story, an oral history from the Calipuyans of how people witnessed a giant flood that came and, and flooded the valley to the point where they had to escape to the tops of mountains to escape the floodwaters. And so um, I think they were eyewitnesses to one of, the, one of, if not all of the Missoula floods that came into the valley. Uh, some, you know, 16,000 to 11,000 years ago. Um, and that means these stories, if they are Missoula flood stories, which seems like they may, they quite well may be, um, are, are quite old. Uh, they are perhaps 16,000 years old, um, which could be some of the oldest histories that we actually have in Oregon or anywhere really. So, um, and, um, much of what we know about the Calipuyans is, is, is from just a few ethnographic notes that were collected by um, anthropologists and, and linguists back in the 19th century, in the early 20th centuries. There isn't a complete record because before the Calipuyans could be uh, collected from, the, the information could be collected from them, uh, many of them had passed on, they were moved onto a reservation. And the ethnographers didn't actually get busy with them until they'd been on the reservation for some 30 years. So uh, we have an incomplete record, but what we have um, gives us some clues as to what their, their world was like. This is a, a Kalapuya calendar that was collected in 18, uh, I think it's 1877 uh, from uh, the Grand Ronde Reservation by Albert Gatchett, who was a uh, German anthropologist who came into Oregon and did his his work here and he collected a lot of languages. He wrote down a 12-month calendar and most of this calendar is based on the cycles of follow uh, the camas. And so we see it, um, really their first month begins uh, around September or so. Um, and then they have a name for each month, and these names uh, have a meanings. And so this, this on the first month, this this name I can't even say it. Um, it means after harvest, the Indians are still out. So that means that probably around September or so, uh, they've been harvesting in the valley, um, and uh, they're still out, probably returning back to their villages. In October, which is the second month here, they be they begin to get the wapato. The Sagittarius route, and and then it continues through the winter time. They they are processing Wapato. They may have a few months of good weather, but they're really kind of staying all day in their winter houses, living off the storage they had made from the previous year of food from the valley um, from the harvest. Um, it says six month here. They're out of provisions. This is probably around February or so. Uh, February it begins a time when people are run out of their storage. They're they're, can, they're essentially what we call now call their canned goods or preserved foods. Um, and uh, so some hunt, some starve, and so people begin to starve a little bit. They begin looking for food, and the first spring comes in around March or so, 
and uh, Camus begins to erupt from the ground. And that time, they looks like they are digging Camus. They are actually out there before it, flowers, digging the Camus up to eat that, uh, to process that and eat that. They uh, they then, you know, process the Camus, and then in May the Camus begins to bloom, and that's pretty common if you know about Camus in the valley. There's several fields in Salem area. Um, it does bloom in between April, May into June, late June sometimes in some areas. And then they also uh, have a tenth month, which is midsummer, when the Camus is ripe. So now it's a time you can actually, after it flowers and goes to seed, the Camus is then um, able to go be harvested again. So there may be several times of the year that Camus is used, which makes it a major staple crop for any, tri any people surviving through the harsh winters at that point. And winters back then were much harsher than they are today. Um, I've read some newspaper accounts from the 19th century, uh, 1850s, 1860s, suggesting that the Columbia would actually freeze, sol or freeze over solid, allowing wagons to cross it with horses. Um, and in fact, the early 20th century, there are accounts of people driving their cars on the Columbia River because it was frozen over solid. That hasn't happened apparently since the 1960s. But uh, and so we are definitely in a warming trend in, in this area. Um, and then just an introduction to some of the other foods um, that are not mentioned on the calendar, you know, uh, elk and deer um, are constantly around. Uh, the Wild Valley was famous for deer and elk, especially white tailed deer and elk. Uh, white tailed deer are not so present anymore. In fact, they may be somewhat close to extinction. Um, but uh, the elk were uh, an attractant. They actually attracted tribes by the places to come to the valley and, and camp through the summer times. Um, and because uh, there was so much elk in the valley that it was really impressive. So, and then other things like uh, sturgeon at the bottom here and, and salmon. You see salmon cooking and says steaks over a fire. Salmon would absolutely be part of the foods they collected as well. Maybe the Calapuyans didn't collect as much salmon as maybe the Chinookans, because Chinookans were on the riverside where there were major salmon runs, several salmon run, runs for the year. The Calapuyans were probably more focused on uh, vegetal foods and uh, maybe hunting a little bit than fishing because they didn't have the fishing falls that the Chinookans had. And then uh, associated with some of these uh, areas are also the waterfowl that would fly into the area seasonally. And so they would absolutely be hunted as well. So uh, moving on to some pictures of these plants we've been mentioning. So we have Wapato here on the far left. Wapato is called Indian potatoes. Uh, we have Camas in the middle and on the right side, Camas flowers in large fields. Sometimes called uh, Camas prairies uh in the valley um not so much anymore there used to be a lot more but um because much of the valley now has been turned into agriculture but it used to be huge fields that were actually just a lot of food for the tribes and then um they when you first harvest them on the top here we see them have this sort of like black skin on them and then as you uh peel them down they turn white and then you those are the things that you would cook and they would cook them in about three days in a pit um, and then and then change the starches to a more usable protein for um, humans. Uh, if you ever do this yourself, uh, please don't eat them until you cook them because um, they can cause major gas. Um, so uh, unless you want gas, I, I doubt you want gas. <laughs> so uh, and the other plant on the top here is is tobacco. There is an indication in some um, of the ethnographies that um, the tribes did did have their own little plantations of tobacco, small plantations they, they planted next to longhouses they used for ceremonial use. So that's the only plant that we know of so far that uh, may have been actually harvested as a crop, you know, by the tribes. And we see this is kind of a detail what we call seasonal round a model of what they may have been doing through the year in different seasons. Uh, this is mainly based on the Calapuyans, not on the Chinookans so much. Uh, but we have the winter village at the top here. We have um, basically living in the ground in these, these, these cedar and bark roof houses. Uh, they may have some hunting camps when they begin to starve. 
spring salmon comes in so they could trade for that they don't really have a lot of it but they could go to places like Willamette Falls or other villages of the Columbia and trade for salmon and normally they would get dried or smoked salmon that's not not, not always fresh salmon and then uh camas root can be uh 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 harvested and these are done with encampments people would travel to the fields uh, camp the field for a week or two harvest the camp camas process it turn into a cooked form and then bring back the the packets of of already pre-cooked camas back to their homes for storage um there may be other camps for weaving materials for huckleberries in the summertime they may go to trade gatherings when there were fish runs on on the columbia later in the summer's acorn camp uh, where they would uh, harvest acorns from the oak trees and there was large oak savannas throughout the valley and then we have more weaving materials at the end of the summer and then more salmon to be traded for with the fall salmon run and then they may have a fall prairie fire which is late usually in september or sometime where they actually set the prairies on fire um, to help sort of revive the crops and to sort of get rid of all the excess underbrush hazelnut camps uh i didn't throw a wapto camp on here but there was always a wapto camp as well uh in this time period after the fires and in, in the hazelnut time period and then more hunting camps and then trade gatherings as well so this is kind of a model of what their yearly cycle could be with different plants kind of following almost a farmer's almanac type cycle really um, around knowing when things were ripe and ready and then following the plants to their fields or going where the hunting was good or and then setting up camps for hunting for fishing for processing foods in around the 1830s where is when major changes come uh, this is in the midst of the fur trade era uh the tribal economies begin to change away from uh this sort of traditional life way where they're 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 only getting their food through harvesting to trading for many foods and prod, products uh, that were brought by the americans and the british to the area uh so people began to sort of want these things that are brought by the settlers and by the fur traders they are new they're interesting they're perhaps better than what they can make norm normally uh, indigenous manufacturer they don't have metals like the Americans have or like the British have they don't have fabrics they don't have glass beads these are all valuable products that came into the area and people really uh, wanted them first as wealth items and then later on as regular parts of their culture um the Americans begin taking over many of the many of the trading towns uh sort of like and then using the populations in the trading towns as laborers for the new settlements that are that are taking place um uh, and the uh, farmers begin to destroy wild crops by putting in their own um, fields, uh, fencing in fields, bringing in cattle and pigs, which tended to eat the, the native crops uh, and destroy them. But plowing does the major job in the valley where they would uh, plow up whole prairies full of camas and other things, and uh, thereby um, somewhat destroying the native crops of the tribes. And then we see disease coming in just after this, and we'll have a slide on this in a second. Uh, diseases uh, begin uh, around 1830. Um, most scholars believe it was malaria that came in and made the major changes. Malaria, kill, malaria killed off somewhere, somewhere between 85 and 97% of most villages for the Chinookans and the Kalapuyans. Um, they stopped being the most populous people in most areas when settlers began coming in the tens of thousands. And they had to constrict down to smaller villages and fewer villages. So where there had been 10 villages with many bands aligned with a major tribe, people would move to the major villages and uh, basically constrict down to the major villages on riversides. Um, this allowed this allowed the whole land to look like it was unoccupied. and. and and their previous preparation by setting fires had prepared the land for what Americans and the British saw as, as, as agricultural lands. And so this attracted, so the early settlers then attracted more settlement to the valley, especially think people like the Methodists attract, attracted um, more settlers to the valley. And uh, um, 
this began to sort of uh sort of um uh the process of turning all of the lands of the valley into agriculture rather than just a few acres um and that process began to, to destroy native food crops to the point where tribes couldn't sustain any longer they had to modify their culture to buy or trade for the food of the settlers. In addition, um, Klickitat and Kalitz peoples came over the, the river the river from Washington area and began uh, coming in in, you know, groups of seven to 800 people and sometimes uh, hunting out all the elk. Um, they, were, they also took advantage of the diseases um, uh, and uh, to come into the area and claim the area as their own even though most people knew it wasn't theirs. Um, population loss was so extreme that some tribes had fewer than a dozen people by the time of uh, settlement and uh, removal to reservations. And this, this heavily impacted the culture. Many Kalapuyans that were some of the first colonized for settled the pond began to sort of uh, take day labor at, at farms and began to learn the farming culture and even began to collect their own herds of cattle and horses and plant their own crops in the early days. Um, this did not continue because they were not allowed to continue this, this practice for very long. So again, settlers took the land from the tribes and, and forced the tribes off their lands and sometimes to work for the farmers in order to remain in the area. The only, re the only reason they were, they were uh, tolerated at all is if because they offered a a labor force uh, for building farms, because you know a lot of times farmers would take a mile square piece of land, and that's a that's you know six hundred forty acres, a lot of land for us a family to uh, to process to make into a farm, and so to make fences for, to build barns, to build houses, and so they needed laborers, and the only other laborers in the area were the tribes. So those rat so the rapid settlement after eighteen forty four and the Oregon Trail began. Uh, caused rapid changes of the tribes, um, and then some disagreements. There are a lot of tribes in the south and north fought back, trying to take their keep their lands. Uh, they were not successful for for the most part. Um, but Kalapuyans never really resisted. They they saw they were so reduced in population that they could not mount any kind of resistance, and so they began to just modify their culture to somewhat become farmers in the area. And this is kind of a graphic that shows that changeover from a, maybe a camas field, Kramat camas prairie, to uh, to a monocropped agricultural landscape, which is a representation of the colonization of the area. Um, in the 1850s, the, um, as settlement rapidly commenced, uh, especially after the uh, uh, Donation Land, uh, Land Claim Act was passed by Congress um, that basically assumed that they had ownership and then began giving uh, rights to Americans, especially married couples, to a mile square piece of land in, the, in Oregon uh, for free. Uh, land began to be, uh, be a hot commodity and uh, tribes were kind of in the way. They had done their service. They had done their labor. Um, and uh, initially, Oregon was not considered to be a place uh for anybody else but white americans and so um they didn't want the tribes to have land to have any rights to land they didn't even want to give citizenship to tribes so they decided instead they had two decisions whether or not to to, to basically commit genocide and kill them all get them out of the way or uh somehow save them give them some rights and then move them uh onto reservations so they decided to go with treaties to pay them for their land and move them onto reservations instead of, of, of genocide, which did not seem like a good option to the tribes. Tribes are moved on to the Grand Ronde Indian Reservation in uh, 1856, uh, after they'd been on several other small reservations in the valley. Um, and uh, they, but once they got there, they were not really well cared for. Uh, they were given their first canvas tents Food and supplies and money was very slow to come to Oregon, some 2,000 to 3,000 miles away from the East Coast. Uh, there weren't many banks in this area. They had to go to San Francisco to get the money. Um, supplies that were shipped from the East Coast didn't always make it to Oregon because they were on ships. 
so uh, it was not a, a fun place to live. Uh, people lived very poorly. Many people died in the first years. Probably half the population died in the first, you know, five years because of various factors, changes in, in diet, changes in, you know, nutrition, uh, being in a new environment. They had been moved away from 3, 300 miles away to maybe Grand Ron or the Sluts Reservation. Uh, and uh, many, pe many people were then newly exposed to diseases they hadn't seen before. So we saw an uptick of influenza, of measles, of smallpox, of, of pneumonia, of all kinds of diseases they would never experienced before. And so, um, and this combined with the fact that many of the tribes that came to Grand Ronde were out of a wartime situation, were already pretty well stressed, uh, did not bode well for many of them. And so many people died the first few years. Then at the same time, the tribes were um, exposed to this idea of assimilation. Um, the federal government implemented an assimilative uh, project where they began to put Native uh, children into boarding schools and schooling to get them assimilated to American lifestyles. Uh, they placed intentionally, the federal government actually placed um, uh, religious missions on reservations uh, to be in that assimilation process as well. And then the, 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 the tribal members, the adults were, were given a little bit of land and told to be farmers. And so many of them had never been farmers. And so they struggled with that in the first few years. The problem is Grand Ron and most other reservation lands that were given to tribes that were simply given to tribes for out of their original lands were not always the best lands or, or generally not the best lands at all of the region for growing crops. They were lands that were not desired at all by farmers. And so to expect the tribes to actually grow crops on land that was essentially clay was unreasonable. Um, and, and at some point they had to allow tribes to go back to, to accessing traditional foods um, in combination with whatever food they can grow on their, on their, on their property when they got property. But tribes on reservations are not given citizenship. Uh, the, the treaties did not give citizenship once they're ratified. So they were they were considered to be a foreign nationals inside the United States, or what they called called by the Supreme Court the domestic dependent nations. So, but they were not given the same rights as Americans. They could not leave the reservation legally. They they could not claim citizenship. They couldn't claim land off the reservation. And they had very little, very few rights in the court systems uh, at the time because many of them didn't speak English and courts would not allow people that didn't speak English to testify in court. So there were a series of, um, besides the Grand Ron, there was also the Coast Reservation on, uh, and there are a number of people from the Southern Coast who were moved up there. On the far left here, we see all these people on the, on the Southern Coast different peoples I've, I've marked that were all moved on to the northern part, this 100-mile reservation on the coast. Uh, on on the, the three pictures on the right side are the coastal areas. And uh, these people were put, placed on 1.1 million acres of land. Um, and eventually, they uh, there, were, there were reductions by, in 1865. The center of the reservation was taken away. In 1875, the southern and northern districts were taken away. To the point that uh, all that remained was essentially um, Lincoln County by 1900. Um, but uh, in all, on the two reservations, Grand Ron and, and later on Selets Reservation, there had been initially 4,000 people placed on these reservations. By 1900, there were probably maybe 1,500 to, to 2,000 people left. So this is a graphic detailing some of that assimilation history. Uh, people were made to sort of take jobs, learn what they could. Um, ch churches were built on reservations to sort of get them to assimilate to not just American lifestyle, but American Christian lifestyle. They had to become Christians to become, to get any hope of becoming citizens in the future. Trial children were placed, were, were put in boarding schools and school systems. They were made to wear, wear uniforms. There were actually boarding schools on the reservations where people lived next to where their parents lived, but were not allowed to return home. They had the kids had to remain in, on the in the boarding schools. Uh, the, the initial boarding schools were very poorly managed, and many people died. 
many kids died in the schools. And so parents were really reluctant to send their kids to a place where people were dying. Later on, the Catholics came along at Grand Ronde and built a better boarding school under the U.S. Uh, federal jurisdiction. And uh, it was better ran, better managed, and people would send their kids there because it was really their only option. They were forced to do so. Um, in fact, boarding schools would actually send wagons to the reservations to collect the children uh, and take them to school um, forcibly. Um, so there was no real choice about the matter. Tribes also, again, like I said, adopted an, an agrarian farming agricultural lifestyle. They were given some land at first um, in 1870s, about 100 acres. In 1887, they were given 260 acres, perhaps a little more with several tribal family members, but they had very little acreage, and yet they were expect to make, expected to make their own food. Uh, but this was not going to be... Uh, it was not going to work for very long because most of farming in the United States was turning into giant production farms, giant industrial farms. And so the only th way it worked at all was because they, they didn't pay taxes and not part of the, of the state tax base at all. So they were, they, they got, they got outside of taxes. So, um, but people began another lifestyle where they'd be had, they would plant some crops like something like hay on the reservation and they would move into the valleys in the summertime and then be part of what we call the indigenous uh, itinerant uh, migrant um, uh, farm workers that would move to different fields, um, usually hops, beans, berries, black walnuts, you know, whatever was being harvested in the valley at different time periods. Um, and the whole families would go live in camps and, and throughout the summertime uh, harvesting crops to make some money. This became a lifestyle where this went on for something like 100 years. Um, while their kids were at boarding schools, they were placed in, in places like Chabao Indian School in Salem. And uh, many kids remained there upwards of, you know, 16 years in boarding school. Um, and uh, all boarding schools at the time were, were really Christian based because most uh teachers came out of, of some sort of christian learn college or christian learning situation so um and that was supposed to make better people or of native people by getting rid of their culture by turning them into americans making them more civilized in in that manner so um it took generations for it to work, but I think it eventually worked. Um, over generations, people began to get further and further away from their culture, and um, many people forgot their culture, never learned their languages, and and many people today don't know what their history is, what their languages are, what their culture is because of, of this history. Again, agriculture, tribes are given farms on the reservation like we see here um and, and tribes were sort of kept away from their traditional resources that those things like camas became um what they call poor men poor man's food and they didn't allow them to go harvest camas or not allow them to but they wouldn't want to because they wanted to be to be seen as as rich wealthy people so uh, and people adopted. So people adopted American lifestyles um, and farm. those farms became, uh, for a while, uh, the tribal culture, you know, on the reservation. But it was very difficult as sort of a, a recap, um, lack of adequate food, lack of supplies, lack of housing, lack of medicines, lack of enough land. And uh, many of the promises that had been made uh, during treaty periods, like payments, like they would have a reservation forever, were never kept by the by the government um, in time because um, it's the right of the president to do so or Congress to do so. Uh, many many of the reservations were uh, terminated, destroyed, as we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and as well, um, people are sometimes confused as to why tribes don't have a better economy, you know, have any kind of good income besides gaming. Well, um, there's a there's a whole set of laws called the Trade and Intercourse Acts, which don't allow reservations, tribal peoples to have uh, an industry unless it's approved by Congress. 
they can't trade beyond their borders without that congressional approval. So many reservations are then impoverished because they have no industry uh, other than what we call the kitchen industry, where people make stuff in their kitchen and sell it outside out of their kitchen. So, um, and that's kind of uh, why we have gaming today, because it's the only one, only thing that all tribes are allowed to do if they have a contract with the state. Here's some pictures of uh, a Grand Ronde farm and people uh, moving into sort of hot picking. Hot picking was very big in the area. For a while, hot, uh, Oregon was the center of hot production in the world until uh, a hop blight hit in the, 18, in the 1960s and destroyed the hops. It's now coming back, but um, native hop pickers were a big deal, um, especially in Wheatland. Uh, outside of Salem, and then Independence was was a big area too. And then uh, we also had um, farm. Uh, we had many native men going into farm. Uh, I mean, logging as a profession because law lo because logging became really the wealth of Oregon after agriculture, which is really kind of an agricultural crop, but you know it became a new way to do it with logging. And uh, it was uh, thought that native loggers were more attuned to the woods, would be better loggers, and so many of them went in with this understanding and they were paid um, equal wages with the white people. So that was good. Otherwise, if you were a, a native person, you try to get a job, you would almost always get paid less than the white people that in the same area. So, but logging tends to be the, the place where a lot of people uh, went to because they got paid fair wages. So uh, moving forward uh, to about 1940s, um, federal government began this process of trying to relieve itself of the burden of having to pay for all of the tribal reservations in the United States. And there were many of them. And so uh, that was a bill of some $40 billion a year for the government. Um, so uh, in 1944, they began to, they began to do, do research on the tribes, uh, figure out what kind of properties they had, whether or not they were assimilated or not, not assimilated or not. And uh, because the Oregon tribes were considered assimilated, they're placed in an assimilated category. Um, they were thought to be the first round of people to be uh, terminated under the a new termination and liquidation uh, policies of the federal government. So Western Oregon tribes, um, especially uh, uh, the whole Willamette Valley, the, all of Western Oregon really, were terminated under Public Law 588. Uh, Klamath tribes are terminated under public, under public law 587. And uh, uh, by 1954, um, so we were relieved of our reservations. They terminated the reservations and all rights as well. Essentially, they terminated the treaties to make, make it so that all of our rights were terminated. Tribes um, saw a lot of decline in the 1960s because of termination. We lost many of our languages, lost our cultures. Uh, people began losing their connection to uh, their tribe altogether, knowledge of the tribal history. Uh, and so in the 1970s and 80s, the tribes in Oregon got to, got busy and being restored. Those that hadn't, those had been terminated. And so we see the Burns Paiute restored in 73, Celets in 1977, Cow Creek in 82, Grand Ron 83, the Coos, Lower Umpqua, in 84, Klamath, 86, Coquel, 89, and the Warren Springs and Umatilla were never terminated, so they never had to get restored. But uh, this is the, the record of restoration, and it was decided that tribes needed to sort of uh, manage their own affairs. Otherwise, they would be they would disappear forever as a people and culture. So um, that was... Uh, the, that became the policy, restoration became the policy. And right now we're kind of in a rebuilding phase. We're trying to rebuild a lot of our culture, a lot of our languages, a lot of our sovereignty, really. And, uh, you know, we've rebuilt like a plank houses. We have canoe culture now in the area. We have lots of artwork and carvings going in in various places. People are, le we're learning our history. Like I do history research. That's part of my process of of finding new things, finding old things that are lost, uh, finding out histories, detailing histories. Um, but sovereignty is the real uh, issue. We need to have sovereignty over our 
land, over our resources, over our people, over our policies, and tribes are continually working for uh, control over their, their own stuff and uh, taking back control from the federal government that has assumed control for more than 200 years. And I want to say thank you and kapai, and uh, that's a Kalapui expression of thank you um, uh, for listening to presentation today. And I think this is the time we start opening up for questions. Yes, thank you, David. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today. We do have some questions that were pre-organized um, by our count DEI council here at DCBS, but please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A section of our meeting and we will get to those our working chronologically kind of the first question that came up was how was food stored and moved from one location to another after harvesting uh, but, you know, I think I mentioned they were processed, um, various ways of processing foods, uh, either cooking it in, in underground pits, uh, pre-processing it, um, you know, things like salmon could be uh, dried, wind dried or, um, or smoked. Uh, and then all times, you know, uh, deer and elk would be sort of like made in jerky. Uh, and so uh, these are the ways that you preserve food for, for some months sometimes. And then uh, they would be moved around by um, many times, woven baskets, you know, were, were, and bags were you made to sort of move products from one place to another place. Canoes are also pretty useful. And later on when we had uh, earlier tribes would sometimes pack, um, put packs on dogs, like large dogs that were sort of bred for moving uh you know pat large packages around uh but uh, later on we had horses too so uh horses came around 1700 or so and that wow. became a, a wealth item but later on they were very useful for moving stuff around but initially like most people lived on red rivers so canoes would be used a lot and then when they were taken to the long houses for storage they would be put in underground pits they would build pits into the ground and then they would store them and it would, in those that ground the dirt provides some insulation, you know, and the packages of, of food would be packed around like large leaves, like, you know, big leaf maple and leaves and stuff. So well packed, probably several layers of leaves and stuff. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, and then we have another question uh, that provides a little bit of background, but I do believe that it is an important question to ask. So we had someone ask about her granddaughter who is part Native American, but belongs to a tribe that's in Eastern California. This individual wanted to know, would it be appropriate to take her to some of the local powwows or activity, activities of closer tribes? Um, this asker wanted to emphasize that they would like to respect the culture and boundaries and don't want to assimilate into a different tribe, but do want their granddaughter to be able to identify with her lineage and learn about her heritage? Yeah, I mean, there's various questions here. I mean, people, different people take, um, uh, give different advice about this. I mean, powwows are normally, because the way they're constructed is, they're normally open to the public uh, and they're, they're usually announced um, in a lot of colleges, a lot of uh, some, a few high schools here and there, but mostly colleges have powwows that are available. And then many tribes will have at least one or two powwows a year you can go to. Other events like uh, more traditional ceremonies like Nadosh or Sion or, or line dancing or feather dances may not be open to the public. You have to be invited. And so um, you may want to see i mean if she wants to get more in touch with her her tribe 
she may need to make personal uh, connection with people that will teach her stuff. You know, it's also it's also good to do a lot of of uh, learning on your own. Re read the books, uh, get the magazines, uh, do as much reading about the tribal culture and history as possible before you do this stuff, because coming in knowing nothing at all um, would would not necessarily be a respectful way to do that. So. And kind of building off of that question, do you have any recommendations for readings or areas where people can go and start to do some of that work of learning directly from um, Native people? And how would you recommend that they go about furthering their knowledge? Well, sometimes um, people get connected with um, other tribal people at colleges. There's Native student unions, Native organizations um, you can get involved with and, and volunteer to and, and do. I mean, that's one of the things when I did as I was younger, I went to University of Oregon and I joined the NASU and and uh, they got involved with throwing powwows and stuff. And I learned, I met a lot of people and learned a lot of things just by doing that. So put throw yourself out there as part of the community, do the work. Um, don't expect to be given it to you, but actually get out and do some work is the best way to do and, and libraries you generally have collections of, of books so start to read you know start to read a lot um and 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 don't still stop you know keep on reading about the tribes tribal history all aspects of tribes um you know you know that's just what you have it's your responsibility you, you have library resources there's public libraries salem itself has a very large native american section in our Salem library, so it's easy to get into. Um, all all universities have libraries that are publicly accessible. You can go in there and read books, no problem. So there's plenty of resources out there. You just need to start doing it. And just a small plug, we will share your website that has a tremendous amount of information as well for yeah. our participants to access. Um, our next question is, how can we help to support tribal so, so, tribal sovereignty today? Um, you know, uh, I think tribes, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess you'd have to ask that of the tribes themselves. I don't represent tri any tribes. I'm, I'm an independent kind of researcher. I used to work for Grand Ronde. Um, I, I used to at some point work, to, work for Celets a little bit, um, but I don't work for a tribe today. So I don't know what they necessarily need. I, mean, I guess they, if if they're sponsoring um, bills or if they they need help with education or something, I guess show up and, and help sponsor that. Um, uh, if, uh, I mean, one thing we're, like one thing that the state of Oregon has, is doing or supposed to be doing is, offering um native education in the schools that's actually a, a, a education department um a goal and they have you know people hired to do the work and they have curriculum now developed and it's all available on the website and yet schools today are not necessarily offering um that curriculum at all uh, i think there's a number of issues there's funding issues there's issues of, of needing need to train teachers that to be able to tr teach the curriculum so whatever you can do to show up at, at uh, education committee meetings and say, this is something I want for the people of, you know, whatever town you're in, Salem, Eugene, uh, whatever town you're in, uh, is good, you know, and uh, the more that parents and others that are concerned step up and say, this is an important thing, we need a part of, have it a part of our community, then uh, that's good. So, um, but yeah, education would be great. I think the basic problem with uh, people not knowing about tribes is is that people just don't understand the importance of our our history and culture, and and unless people uh, appreciate that and respect that, it's going to be hard to make any progress in sovereignty. Um, kind of building upon that, um, we can see the lack of information and education and the results that that has gotten um, people who may not be native, but are there further or lasting effects that forced assimilation has had on 
native people and your cultural identity as a whole? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I think we're still, you know, while tribes are restored as sovereign nations, we have some land and we have a governmental operations and we have a center now, kind of a cultural center and a political center. We are not fully restored as a tribal people in many ways. You know, we're still, you know, my tribe, I think that 75 to percent of our people still struggle with understanding what tribes they came from because we had upwards of 32 tribes come to Grand Ron and people just don't understand in many ways people from the tribe itself don't understand who they are what their tribe is where they're from what their cultures are so we are there's long-standing issues with that um, that it's going to take some generations to sort of fix um, right now there are programs at the tribe for teaching uh language and culture to to younger people and that will have an effect into the future as more and more people are taught the and more information um uh, the there our elders coming into the future will, will know more about their their people than today uh but yeah there's just long-standing issues with that um in the tribe itself and you know not to mention the fact that if we don't know in our tribe who we are or what the culture is or what the what the history is most people outside the tribe don't know it either so it's just a matter of taking responsibility for that learning it passing it on and hoping that there's some sort of cascading effect in the future of, of people learning about their about who they are thank you um we did have quite a few <laughs> questions about um, languages and both their disappearance as well as kind of their resurgence. Is there a trend in revitalizing and preserving these languages? Um, and if so, is that happening in a formal education setting or is that more on a tribal outreach and engagement level or other level? Um, yeah, so most languages um in oregon most native languages have have gone extinct there are about a half dozen or so maybe a few more um that have been somewhat preserved the problem is we only have a couple maybe a dozen speakers at the most uh that are sort of fluent speakers of languages um most of most most tribes are down to like one or two speakers left um which doesn't necessarily make make it look good for the future for them um so the tribes do have language programs and are trying to teach languages and, and get sort of the next generation of scholars and, and language learners going uh tribes like umatilla and warm springs and grand ron Slets, uh and even cow creek ha all have active language programs or teaching people language uh, Grand Ronds may be the most advanced. I don't know. Um, I haven't looked at all of them. Uh, but we do have uh, Chinook Wawa language uh, all the way up to at least fourth grade, as well as a number of, um, we do offer some college classes at LCC, PSU. Um, and uh, so there is that, but but the universities ne aren't necessarily helping. Um, they're, they're, they're offering scholarships scholars to come help a little bit but the universities themselves are not necessarily teaching languages um there is some education happening in schools like willamina offers Chukwawa. but again like like i said um we only are working on one language Chukwawa. um we had 32 other languages come to grand ron and or dialects and uh all of them are not being worked on so calipuy is extinct umqua is extinct um Malala is extinct I mean and there's no it would take millions and millions of dollars to have a program and then in, and then enough people in the program interested to sort of relearn these languages uh and there's a lot of problems um like what do you do with it how how is you how do you use it how do you keep it going um a lot of issues there so uh uh English happens to be a very good colonizing language i mean everything in our industry in, in business is, is in english for in the united states and so it's really difficult 
to maintain a uh, all these other native languages, uh, even even to bring them back at all in this environment. Thank you. Um, we also had quite a few questions asking for a little more information on the restriction of industry on um, tribal land, including yeah. questions about has the access to enterprise slash capital funding improved in the current day? Have those um, industrial restrictions kind of lifted? If so, is there a way that you can suggest for people to help support opening those funding channels for different tribal business enterprises? I mean, tribes have other enterprises besides gaming. Gaming uh, was an act that was passed by Congress in 1990, the American Indian Gaming Act, and uh, it allowed all tribes to have form a compact within their state with the governor, with the gov governments of the state to have casinos. And so some states, some tribes have multiple casinos, some tribes have one. So in Oregon, I think the policy is is most tribes to have one casino, um, and that's they've maintained that for a long time. Um, some tribes have other industries, like uh, I think Warren Springs has had like uh, some timber industries, uh, but most tribes are not. You know, Klamath had, at one point was one of the richest people on the earth. They had major timber. They had a million acres of ponderosa pine. They had major timber um and that was all taken away with their termination um the osage nation used to be the the richest people on the face of the earth where they had uh major oil reserves at that at when 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 cars just began to become a big thing in the early 20th century and they became hugely rich and then there's a movie coming out called uh was it um the flower moon movie that's coming out on apple tv or something that's uh uh that documents uh, really um, the loss of the, those resources by the Osage, um, how they were, how people were killed and stuff for it. So, um, so there's lots of issues there. Um, but the main problem is the is the paternalistic laws that were passed by the United States to control uh, any kind of industry on reservations, uh, and it's all embedded inside what they call the Trade Intercourse Acts, which which began in 1780s. I think 1789 or 88 or something like that and there's a number of uh updates that happened 19 in the 1830s and and so those are still in effect and so tribes legally cannot have an industry on the reservation where they sell their products over their borders without uh congress make uh passing a bill saying that's okay um, and it takes sometimes 40 to 50 years or longer for that to happen. So that's not helpful at all. And, and so um, it would be great if uh, in our that we had better sovereignties or we had a, a less of a dependency on the United States, that we were allowed to be independent nations inside the United States, and that we had our own control of our own uh, finances like that so we could have our own industries. Um, that would be great. Uh, but I don't see Congress, even this Congress, especially this Congress, moving that way anytime soon. Um, and then the, the other thing is, you know, most tribes don't have a lot of resources on the reservation. Like I said, we were given the worst land and the worst places. You know, Warm Springs continually has problems with water. Why, why do they have that problem with water? Well, because the initial water in that basin was never good in the first place. No farmers, no American farmers wanted to live there. So that that land was basically considered useless to Americans. There is literally no resources there except for logging resources. So, uh, yeah, th that's I mean, it's it's just not is access to land, fair access to land, access to resources, and then the ability to sell beyond the borders of the reservation freely is a big issue. Uh, I think uh, there's an author Robert Miller who's written a number of books on sort of capitalism in Indian country uh look him up he's a native american scholar and researcher he's a lawyer um but he's he's pretty good um addressing a lot of the laws and legalities of, of tribal business on reservations so thank you and i we have one more question before we wrap up we did get quite a few questions in our chat so thank you 
to our audience. And of course, thank you again, Professor Lewis, for all of your understanding and sharing your knowledge. Um, the majority of our um, participants today represent um, state of Oregon agencies. And one question that we did see come up quite a few times surround how can we respectfully and authentically engage with our tribal partners so that we can ensure that they are accurately represented and that their perspectives are heard? I guess there's a couple of ways to do this. I mean, there's probably many ways of doing this. I, mean, I don't have the rule book necessarily um, about what's the best way to do it. Um, in Oregon, there is a system in place where all uh, Oregon, Oregon offices or departments are supposed to have a liaisons. I don't know how well that system works or whether every department actually utilizes it appropriately. Um, I have heard that at some at, that it's not necessarily utilized well. I think that if there if the liaisons are given more power, that if all departments actually had liaisons, that they would probably work better. Um, and then working with tribes, tribes really like in terms of their relationships, their business relationships or anything uh, to have long-term relationships with their partners. And so um, establishing um, levels of trust by having long-term commitments, MOUs, MOAs can help quite a bit. Uh, and then having a commitment in-house uh, for Oregon departments would be helpful. Um, hiring more Native American people, it would be helpful as well. I mean, because the more that you have Native people working for you or with you uh, in your in your your departments, the more you'll have a better understanding in your relationships with the tribes. Um, so, and this is all. I mean, this all may take a lot of sort of pro programmatic and and policy changes. Which is how you do your, your work. Um, Oregon tribes are a big part of the economy of Oregon. We are major. I, I, I'm just saying the big we are, are major uh, contributors to Oregon economies. We, you know, uh, there's there's compacts with the state for gaming. Much of the that gaming money goes for things like roads and, and education. Perhaps a few other projects, depending on what the compact says for each tribe, but. Um, but these are major contributors um, in most of the of the counties and the areas they they are from, and so it does it does seem like there's an unspoken need, uh, an unmet need perhaps, uh, of reaching out more with the tribes, forming better relationships, bringing them in into in a deeper way with in your programmatic goals not just to help the tribes, but to help all of Oregon with it do its business, so. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to hand things over to Teresa Rainey from the Oregon Employment Department to help us wrap things up. Um, again, thank you so much, Professor Lewis, for a inspiring and educational um, presentation. Well, thank you. It's been great. It's been fun. Thank you so much, Brittany. And again, I'm Teresa Rainey, she, her, and Director of Equity and Inclusion at the Employment Department. On behalf of OED, I want to extend our deepest gratitude to Professor Lewis for everything he shared with us today. This has been an incredible event to honor the people who have been here in Oregon since time immemorial and will always be here. I'd also like to thank our colleagues at DCBS for inviting us to co-sponsor this event and for coordinating all of the preparation that goes into these events. It is not as easy as it looks. Many thanks as well to our two American Sign Language interpreters for their work today. And finally, I'd think, like to thank all of my colleagues at the Employment Department, either here live or watching the recording, for taking the time to honor Native American Heritage Month with us and for the critical work you do every day. And as Professor Lewis highlighted the importance of state agency tribal liaisons, I'd like to note that OED's tribal liaison is Rebecca Nance, and I encourage you at OED to reach out to her with your questions and ideas. So I'd now like to invite Autumn Blake from DCBS to close us out and thank you again.
Thank you, Teresa. I would echo everything that you said. Um, I'm Autumn Blake, she, her, with the DCBS Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council. Uh, thank you so much to our attendees for joining us and also for being patient as we work through some of our technical issues. On behalf of everyone, I would like to express our immense thanks to Professor Lewis for sharing his time and his insight with us. It's been invaluable. Um, I'd also like to thank our partners, uh, Business Oregon, the Employment Department, and the Department of Administrative Services. The video recording of today's event will be available in the coming days on the DCBS website, as well as through Workday. If you have any questions after the event, you can reply to the calendar invite you received, or you can reach out to Veronica Murray. She is the DCBS Diversity and Inclusion Manager. And I also want to note that the tribal liaison for DCBS is Ruth Kemi. So thank you so, so much for everyone who joined us today. Thank you.